online dating algorithms. Like that's the com- most common way that we're meeting people in the U.S. And we're relying less on our networks to make those introductions. And there are consequences to that. Thank you for joining us today, Liesl. I would love to find out how you got into such a, a niche and, and, and a very popular topic as of right now. So this has been something that's been really interesting to watch over the past decade or so, just how the dating landscape has changed. And I've been studying uh, dating apps for a really long time now. And I started to get interested in this actually around the time that I was graduating from college because I had a lot of friends who were moving out of state. Um, They didn't necessarily know anyone where they were living. They were starting to use online dating. But at the time, it was still very stigmatized. So they weren't necessarily open about how they were meeting people. So they were going on lots of dates. They were ending up in these great relationships, but they were very secretive about it. And it was really interesting to watch. And I remember thinking at the time, this is this is going to be the future. Like there's so much potential here. Yet, you know, you have people that are still kind of hesitant because social norms were changing. Um, and now, you know, fast forward to where we are today and everyone's on dating apps. It's the most common way that we meet romantic partners in the U.S. And so it, it's just been really remarkable to see how quickly things have evolved. I know from our perspective with a lot of our clients, there seems to be a rising frustration around the apps and the marketplace dynamics that these apps have created. Um, But starting looking back, we started the show 17 plus years ago and online dating sites required you to be in front of a desktop, required you to put your credit card in and really had high intent behind actions around committing to a dating site. Now with the rise of apps and just the ease of use, the dynamic has completely shifted. What does the science show us around the original adoption of online dating sites to where we are now in the app landscape? Yeah. So, I mean, online dating sites, the way they worked, the people who were using them, I mean, they were all quite a bit different. First of all, they attracted an older demographic. So now when you look at the people who are using dating apps, it's largely young people, people under the age of 30. They've really been able to bring online dating to a much younger demographic. And part of the reason that they've been able to do that is because they've really gamified the experience. And so they've made it fun to just swipe and to accumulate matches. They've turned it into a game. Um, and so in doing that, they've drawn in a lot of younger people, but they've also drawn in a lot of people who aren't necessarily serious about meeting anyone. And so I think that's where some of the frustration comes from. Like if you're on there really serious about finding a relationship, Sometimes it can be tricky and and really frustrating when you're interacting with people that are on there just to kind of have fun and swipe and see who they can match with. Um, And so dating apps have really enabled those sorts of possibilities. And also with traditional dating sites, I mean, the matchmaking process was really different. So they were largely pulling in questionnaires. They were drawing information from relationship science. They were asking people, okay, who are you? What are you looking for? Let's see if we can deliver that for you. Whereas with dating apps, it's much more based on your behaviors. So people aren't going to spend like an hour signing up for Tinder. They're just not going to answer all those questions. They just want to get out there and start matching with people. And so also you see, um, you know, people getting these matches, they don't really know why people are being recommended to them. They don't really know how to change their recommendations. And so I think that's also um, a source of frustration for some people. Well, that gamification piece seems to be one of the real challenges around the concept of the original idea of online dating was to get you to meet up in, in real life and actually find someone who was a true match. Now, it seems like the app's entire goal is to get you to spend more time on the app and the meeting up in person is inconsequential to their bottom line. Yeah. And so it's a really interesting business model because you have a situation where sometimes the goals of the platform, they're really incongruent with the goals of the users. So you have people on there that are maybe looking for the love of their life, like they really want to meet someone, but is that in the best interest of a platform to have you sign up and immediately you know, introduce you to someone that you're going to want to run off and have a relationship with? Or is it better if you're on there just continuously swiping, going on dates, having fun, coming back to the platform? 
And so I think that, you know, with the gamification, the goal is to get you really engaged, to get you swiping, to get you dating. But I don't know if the goal is always to deliver a relationship. And so if that's what you're looking for, I think that can also be a tricky thing to navigate because the platforms aren't necessarily designed for that, depending on which one you're using. Well, that's very apparent now that we have a class action lawsuit for the makers and the the Tinder group, the match group. We tell all of our clients the pros and the cons of online dating. Because of the marketing, it is so powerful that a lot of folks have uh, certain expectations in joining these sites. And as you mentioned, um, it is very incongruent of what the, the makers of the site intended and how the users are using it. And that, that incongruence is only getting larger as, as the game of vacation part is being gamified by the folks who are using it in order to get to leverage it and take advantage of it. And so we are also seeing once these Tinder match, all of these online swipe life apps came out, um, we saw a, um, a rise in a lot of depression and, and how people feel about themselves and which can be closely correlated uh, to those apps taking off and gaining in, in popularity. I certainly deal with a lot of people who are looking to revamp their online profile and and we and this is one of the things that we help our our clients with but I am very strong into uh, to having them understand how this will affect their mind in using it and what to look out for so that they don't become manipulated through the app. Yeah, absolutely. And you also have to think about the people who are really relying on the apps a lot for meeting people. Oftentimes, I think there's this this idea that, okay, I'm having a hard time meeting people face-to-face. If I use dating apps, it's going to make things easier for me. So you get people who maybe are already struggling with their mental health. They're already feeling really lonely, and they think the dating apps are going to solve those problems. And then they get out there and they realize, okay, this introduces a whole new set of issues you know, it's better in some ways, maybe worse in others. And so sometimes they find that it actually exacerbates some of those symptoms. It actually makes them feel more isolated uh, and makes them feel worse about themselves because you're getting all of these little micro rejections that are kind of accumulating over time. And then there can also be the sense that like, okay, if the pool's so large, if you're meeting people all the time and it's not working for you, like in some ways, I think that can sometimes make people feel even worse. Um And so it's a really difficult thing to navigate. I mean, I think there are a lot of benefits to the apps, but at the same time, I think it's important for people to realize that if they're encountering those difficulties, it's not them. And some of this is also by design. It's the way the apps are set up. Yeah. And I certainly think one of the draws of the apps is the perceived reduction in rejection, right? You get a match. So idea of walking up to a stranger and trying to strike up a conversation and create that match is very phys- physically and mentally challenging for a lot of us, especially coming out of the pandemic with this fear around socializing. So there's this concept of, okay, well, if I make a match, then that lowers the likelihood of rejection. But what also has happened online is there's been artificial markets that are now created around metrics that we wouldn't necessarily judge people around in person. Height, occupation, these are things that we don't walk around town with a tape measure We're not constantly looking at people's occupation or their LinkedIn when they see us in person, but yet this is readily apparent on the apps. These are some of the few things that are the easiest for us to fill out, but then also are the most detrimental to us finding those matches and then can lead you down the rabbit hole of feeling like the marketing says my match is just around the corner. My experience is completely different than that. So it must be me. It can't be the algorithm and it can't be what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And we know from research that what people look for in dating apps, it's not always aligned with what they're going to find attractive in person. And so when you think about things like height, it's like, okay, a lot of people who use dating apps have this very specific height requirement. People feel compelled to disclose that information because they know people are going to be looking for it. 
But when you meet somebody in person, I mean, the first question I always ask, are you even going to notice, right? If somebody is a few inches off of your height requirement, is that something that you're actually going to register? And is it something you're going to be paying attention to? Because when you get with somebody face to face, you pay attention to the experience of what it's like to interact with them. You know, are they funny? Do they make me feel comfortable? How are they treating other people around us? Like, do I enjoy being in their company? You're not thinking about some of these things that dating apps really tell us to prioritize. You know, what do you, what's your favorite TV show? How tall are you? What do you do for a living? I mean, when we're thinking about relationships in particular, those aren't necessarily the qualities we look for in a partner when we start thinking about the long term and what a future with that person would look like. And so I think that also leads to a lot of disappointment where you have people spending a lot of time on the apps. They have this like wish list of what they want in a partner and then they find it and they meet that person and they they get really you know upset because they're like, this is not... This isn't what I was picturing. And so it feels like there's something broken with the process. And I think a lot of it is that mismatch between what people think they want and then what they actually pay attention to when they get in front of somebody. And with it being anonymous, it incentivizes us to potentially be a bit more dishonest than we would be face-to-face around our preferences, our height, our occupation, our likes. And then, of course, when we find this out later, the concept of catfishing, the regret, the disappointment that the person you met online doesn't match your perceived expectation can, again, be that, that negative connotation around, well, I just need to get off these apps. It's very exhausting to be wasting my time meeting people that aren't representing themselves truthfully. Yeah. And I mean, the dating apps, they encourage it too. I think people feel like they kind of have to sell themselves. Like they really feel like they have to do things to make themselves stand out because they know that you're swiping through so many profiles. Like you've got, you might feel this pressure, like I really have to be compelling to someone. And so I think sometimes people, they exaggerate, they kind of misrepresent themselves and they don't even necessarily realize that they're doing it. So then you're also going on a lot of first dates. You're not having second dates. You're wondering like, what am I doing? wrong here, what's happening. And I think sometimes also it's that people think they're being very truthful in how they're presenting themselves, but other people sometimes feel a little bit misled when they see them in person and it's not entirely what they were expecting. Well, again, we have social media sites that are now manipulating our minds uh, around, uh, around the app and how we, and, and our behaviors. And that that carries consequences into the world world that also carries consequences in our relationships and how we relate to each other. If I'm on the app and I'm recognizing that my relationship that was hot and heavy is now cooling off, right? I'm losing out on what is called the the limerence effect. It is now dissipating. Well, that app is right there. I can easily achieve limerence Again, very easily now. And I don't have to put into work to fix my relationship or to get to know my partner uh, in, in order to strengthen that relationship. And then, of, and of course, if we're trotting from person to person to person, after a while, that is going to play a role in the way we attach in our attachments. Yeah. And this is the big question, right? What is this going to mean for long-term commitment? And um, Eli Finkel, he's a psychologist at Northwestern. He's talked about this a little bit and kind of speculated that the best relationships aren't going to be affected. So if you have a really great relationship with someone, you're not going to be compelled to get back on the apps to see if something better is out there. But if your relationship's kind of eh, or if it's starting to maybe fizzle out, you might feel this sort of draw of, okay, I know that I can get back on there and I can swipe so easily. And there is this sort of idea that if you just keep going, maybe there's someone better. Like this person's great, but what if the next person is really awesome? So it kind of keeps you out there looking and exploring things. The thing that you left out in the study and, and the results of that is what what is defined as a good relationship. Yeah. So a relationship that w- was good 50 years ago is different now than a relationship that is good now. 50 years ago, you didn't have Tinder when things sort of were getting off kilter or the relationship had hit a bad patch and you worked it out. Well, now it's different. Yeah. 
And I mean, before you're only meeting so many potential partners, just going about your day-to-day routine, I think there was this tendency to kind of really give something a shot, give somebody a chance, you know, try to make things work. You're only meeting so many partners, whereas now it has become so easy to go back out there and find someone when relationships not working out that that you do have to wonder if it's also potentially making people's standards a little bit higher than they were before um, in terms of what they're looking for. And also when they, you know, decide to keep a relationship to continue it versus getting back out there into the pool. And this investment in the relationship versus the app. So the app has the immediate dopamine payoff of showing you another match and more potential, whereas investment in the actual real life relationship, it could end up in rejection. It could end up in a negative consequence. And I think for a lot of us, even if we do find that great relationship, odds are we don't delete the app. We don't have a switch that says, now I'm in a relationship, stop sending me these matches. We don't even think about it. And then in our weakest moment, uh, I can't remember who shared it, you know, but many of us are on our devices in the bathroom. When we're most vulnerable, we're now presented with, hey, this great opportunity right around the corner. So why would I keep investing in something that maybe is a little iffy or maybe isn't for me based on what I was looking for when the app says, hey, there's this great match just waiting for you to click. Yeah. And it's also led to this like online dating mindset where I think there's this idea that the perfect relationship is just out there. You just have to find it. If you just find the right person, everything will fall into place. It'll all click. So it's about finding a perfect partner versus building a perfect relationship. And we know that relationships take work. People who have more of a growth mindset towards it tend to be more successful when they realize that your relationship's not always going to be perfect. You work through the rough spots. You you know, figure out how to build something with a person. And I think in some ways it's starting to seem like people feel like, no, I, it, if something's happening that I don't entirely like in my relationship, it's a problem with the relationship with the person. I need to find a better person versus now I need to put in the work to actually build something with this individual. And I think it's incentivized us to see more people at once. Yeah. So, you know, we've seen this from clients who feel the need that, well, they shouldn't really commit to anyone. They should keep their options open indefinitely. And of course, that leads to them never getting to the, the depth and the intimacy with any one person that would create that match that they're looking for. So this one foot in, one foot out, I have to keep swiping, I have to keep going on first dates. They seem enjoyable, this idea of meeting someone new for the first time and getting to exchange pleasantries and and that great limerence that Johnny was talking about leads to us keeping our options open indefinitely, never once committing and then being very frustrated by the whole experience. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, I think in some ways that's kind of how the whole experience is set up. It's designed to do that and to kind of keep you out there dating. But if you want a relationship, you do have to eventually decide to go all in with someone and, you know, forego those other options. What you said there is very important. Your thoughts are that these apps are designed to keep people dating. Well, we know that they are because that's what the class action lawsuit is about. And AJ and I witnessed this many years ago when the marketing came out, which was Swipe Life. And I believe that marketing campaign started about 2012, 2013 is when it really started taking off. Just think about that. What is that marketing? It is Swipe Life. You live in a place where you can taste every color of the rainbow and and never... Uh, You can fall in love as many times as you want and that you should because that is what a healthy, happy young person should be doing. But the realization is the longer they keep you on the app, now they can place in advertising in between the swipes. So it is acting as a social media platform. And if it's acting as a social media platform, we know that social media platforms make money by keeping your attention on the app. All of the algorithms from TikTok to YouTube to Instagram is the longer you're on the app, the more you get shown to more people. And so uh, they want you on it because they make more money. And if that is the case, well, we're not going to get in a place where the app is actually helping people find the right person or healthy relationships. And then the other part we have to look at is... (laughs) We are putting 21-year-old children who are living in these massive cities that are incredibly lonely, and these uh, massive cities have a way of being making 
you lonely regardless of how connected we are. The, those large cities were lonely 40 years ago, let alone now. And so you have an endless amount of swipes and dates. You have a malleable 21, 22-year-old girl or guy who, and, and if they are, if they have the benefit, the luxury of being good looking, well, they have endless opportunities uh, using, if using the app correctly. And that's going to carry with it their changes in how they view those relationships and, and view people. And, and also what they are obligated to the people they are dating. So now we have ghosting. That was never a thing. You didn't ghost somebody. You sat down with them and you had to tell them, hey, you know, I, I, I like you, but I don't like like you. And that's a hard thing to do. So it's a hard thing to do. So why do it? Now we don't have to. Well, that's not helpful for society. Because now there's, now there's dating without consequences. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the effect of dating apps, when you look at young adults, I mean, it really is quite profound. So I've done some work looking at people who have formed long-term relationships. So the quote, success stories, the people who found that dating apps really work for them. And I've talked to young people in their early 20s. And I mean, these are the extreme cases. I'm not saying this is true for all of them, but there are uh, people who I've spoken to have said that all of their significant relationships in adulthood have happened through a dating app or they've happened through social media. Um, and there's one person in particular who I was talking to and I asked him, like, you know, if you saw someone attractive in person, would you go up to that person and maybe ask him out? And he said he didn't know because he just never had to do that because all of his relationships have been facilitated by technology. He's never had to put himself out there that way. So for some of these young people, like when you think about dating, the norms, what it looks like, I mean, their model really does involve dating apps for better, or for worse. So when you think about the bad behaviors, ghosting. I mean, all of it for them, this is the world that they've grown up with. Like the technology has always been there. This is the world that they're dating in now. And it's just such a shift, even compared to people my age, you know, millennials, older generations, like we had the ex other experience to compare to of meeting face to face. And for some of them, they just don't necessarily have that anymore. Well, even the leadership of these companies is so far off mark in trying to now force us to find friends through apps, this idea of encouraging chat GPT through asynchronous communication to say the perfect thing on the apps. And now this idea of creating your own AI that will date for you and surf through and swipe to talk to other agents representing you in hopes of finding that one match. I mean, their answer to this is to inject more technology and to have us seeking out the wrong things completely. You know, one of the first things that people who are single will ask us is, what do I say after I set up the profile? What's the perfect first message? What's the perfect way to have the conversation? And now they're running to chat GPT in hopes of finding the perfect words. And we've taken out any ability to have that in-person moment that allows us to really find our partner. If we have just AIs talking to each other through the apps, and that's what they're encouraging, it's, it's a pretty scary world ahead of us. I want to add something to that as well with the AIs. So there's this idea that these AIs are going to be going out and dating for you and then coming back and telling you which is going to be the great date. Okay. So now your AI comes back and says, oh, Sarah is perfect for you. You guys are going to hit it off. I was out with 20, I chatted with 20 people. Sarah is right. Sarah is perfect. Great. I guess um, go ahead, AI, and book a date for me with Sarah on Tuesday. So now we have two people going to meet each other who've never spoken before. And like, my AI said that you like uh, Rugrats and I like Rugrats. So I guess we should talk about r Rugrats. I mean, it's going to be a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see how the apps respond to all of this, because in some ways, I mean, I don't know how they're going to prevent it. Like people are already, like you said, they're using chat GPT to come up with opening lines to help them create profiles. So they're doing it. But at the same time, one of the biggest concerns people have about online dating is that people are misrepresenting themselves. They're worried about being catfished and deceived and and so when you've got people that are really relying on AI to help them communicate, you're just kind of amplifying some of those problems that already exist. So it makes me wonder, I mean, is this going to be 
the final push that just gets people off the apps and meeting in person again, because that's the only way that you can tell if the person you're talking to is being genuine in themselves. I mean, I think there's a role for AI in all of this in the sense that, you know, if you don't know what to say or how to present yourself, AI can give you feedback, maybe give you some guidance and some pointers that could be helpful. And so it's kind of teaching you and coaching you through the process. But if you're relying on it to represent you, that's just going to make some of these problems so much worse where then you're getting with somebody in person and you just can't maintain the dialogue that you had. To take a look at it honestly, the app makers don't want you to feel that feedback and feel negative at all when you're using the apps. So odds are their usage of AI is going to be similar to LinkedIn's usage, which is, hey, auto write this response, auto write this comment for me, summarize these 20 options and pick the right one for me. Um, they're going to use it in a way to, again, remove the negative feedback loop and get us more involved and of course, if other people are running the chat GPT, they're incentivized, the, the makers of these apps are incentivized to bring AI in to their closed circle so that they can make money off of you paying for the premium edition with the AI perfectly matched responses based on all the data that these app makers have on us. Yeah, and it it's so hard too, because the best opening line that you could use is going to be one that's tailored to the person you're talking to and that's genuine and authentic. Like nobody likes having someone just say, Hey, what's up? And you don't, you're like, did you even look at my profile? Do you even know who you're talking to right now? Like people want something that shows that you've invested a little bit of time and that you're actually interested. And so, I mean, I'm not sure how well that's even going to work. I, I guess we'll see. Well, AJ and I know when a, when we get an ad, uh, from a sponsor and it is a chat GBT ad, we know it immediately. I could read you the ad and I'm like, this is a chat GBT that they didn't bother to edit. Somebody in marketing was like, give me an ad for a podcast. And that was, that was it. They didn't even bother to personalize it or anything else. And because of that, uh, I mean, because of it, chat GBT's usage, I, if I could figure it out, so can a lot of other people. And so to send a first message that is a, a generic ask or a generic question, people are going to know pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, it also ends up on the same answer. So, you know, what's funny is you, you can take a screenshot of the profile and feed it into ChatGPT and it'll say, say one of these three things. But guess what? There's a hundred other people who were doing that exact same thing. So it ends up in the same place. AI is not going to personalize it in a way that only AJ had wrote that message and only you received that message from this AI bot. Uh, it's all consuming the same data. It's all consuming the same profiles and personalizing it in ways that it best sees fit. So I'm, I'm really curious to shift gears. I know that Johnny and I have a lot of apprehension around this move to swipe life and apps. And you know we see the fallout in the, the millennials and beyond who either have dabbled in it and, and are frustrated with it and trying to move off of it, um, to the shifting dynamics in real life, dating and relationship building. So, you know, in the past, we used to rely on friends and family, and then maybe we had a third place, a place outside of work and home where we would congregate and meet one another. And we saw the pandemic ravage the third place. We've now worked remote, so we're not connecting with our coworkers as much. And as you said earlier, you know, a lot of young people are now moving away from home to find work, to, to be completely financially and, and independent in their lives. But unfortunately, we're losing all these places where we used to be incentivized to meet people in person. So what have you seen in the research and what are some of these trends around meeting people in real life? Yeah, so um, there's some research out of Stanford that's looked at how people are meeting, who the new intermediaries are, you know, the third parties that are introducing us and connecting us to potential partners. Like you said, it, it used to be people in our networks. So it used to be friends, it used to be family members. And if you look at the data, those ways of being introduced to someone are actually declining at the same time that online dating has just been expanding. So now online dating algorithms, like that's the com most common way that we're meeting people in the U.S., and we're relying less on our networks to make those introductions. And there are consequences to that. 
So one of the things that I've been seeing is that it means that you're introduced to strangers who your friends and family might not necessarily accept. They might not know them. You're kind of cutting them out of the process. So one thing that people sometimes struggle with is kind of getting everyone else that they know on board with the relationship and trying to integrate their partner into that network because they're very much outside of it. And I mean, this is what dating apps are designed to do. They're designed to expand your dating pool and to introduce you to strangers. But when it comes to forming a relationship with somebody, we also know that we really need support from people that we're close to for that relationship for it to work in the long term. And so I think that that's one thing that, um, you know, over time, people sometimes struggle with. Yeah. And this ease of asynchronicity of, of messaging makes it even more challenging than in, in person to come up with the witty line, to rely on chat GPT and, and try to substitute for just having people skills in general, which make us interesting and attractive to the other person. Yeah. And people fall into like these pen pal situations. They spend a lot of time just talking back and forth because it's nice to be able to message and not you know, have the awkwardness of being with somebody in person, having real time conversation. But that also contributes to some of the disappointment, too, because we have a tendency to kind of build people up in our minds. We fill in the blanks, the gaps and everything that we don't know about them. And we create almost this fantasy version of the person. And it makes it really hard for somebody to actually live up to those expectations. So then also you get with somebody face to face and they just, they can't meet the high expectations that you already have of them because of some of those extended periods of messaging that we sometimes fall into. And are there trends along the lines of committed relationships and, and marriage rates in this new world with more and more options in front of us? Yeah. So it's interesting. About 10 years ago, there was a study that came out that compared marriages that started through online dating versus in person. And they found that um, couples who are meeting through online dating, their marriages were a little bit more satisfying. They were a little bit more stable. So you're a little bit better off long term if you met a partner through online dating. But what happened 10 years ago, that was when we also shifted from traditional online dating sites to mobile dating apps. And so we recently did a follow-up study where we looked at this again, looked at marital quality of people who are meeting through dating apps, um, through online dating sites versus in person. And the effect is reversed now. So people who are meeting through online dating, not just the apps, also the traditional sites, their marital quality is a little bit lower than the people who are meeting in person. And so these aren't dramatic differences at the same time, it's interesting to see that shift happen and it makes you wonder, okay, what's going on here? Is it the people that are opting in to using dating apps now? Is it that the process has changed? Um, but in the long term, it, it would seem that for some people, it, it's introducing some problems. Um, one thing I also point to with that is kind of the stigma that still surrounds online dating. Um, I think we think, you know, so many people use it. How can it be stigmatized? Like it's become so common. But what I hear from people is that it's also become really platform specific and also very generational. So now there's this judgment about meeting people through certain types of apps. So it's like if you found a long term partner and you met them on a quote hookup app, you get some kind of judgment from that. So people are sometimes reluctant to tell like friends and family, particularly family how they met someone. And so again, when we're talking about getting support from your social network for the relationship, that can sort of create a barrier for some people. I mean, even right there, what a hookup app is needs to be defined. I think different generations think differently of each app. Um, where the younger generation, because, well, they're younger, so they're going to be more rabbit-like, um, they're going to use them for... <laughs> hookups where an older millennial or, or Gen X is like, oh, it's for dating. Like, I like relationships. I'm trying to find somebody. So they're not going to view Tinder in that manner. You know, even when they brought out Bumble and, and, and all of the other apps, it was always a as an introduction to here's an app that isn't a hookup app. But what give it six months and then it becomes the new hookup the, the app. Latest, <laughs> yeah. The latest, the, the new hookup app because, well, who's going to use it the most? It's going to be the younger folks because they're more rabbit like in their behaviors at that age. 
Have there been shifts in traditional norms or cultural norms around dating? So, you know, uh, obviously looking back before the apps, there were expectations around men to initiate and asking people out and asking for phone numbers and dates. And now the rise in apps, and there were even apps that wanted to shift it completely to, well, the, the women would initiate, and we've seen them now roll that back. Um, is there any data to suggest that there have been these changes in, in what we consider starting a relationship, initiating a relationship? You have apps like Bumble that have tried to disrupt some of those social norms. And I mean, to a large extent, Bumble, they were successful in in getting users. But at the same time, when you look at the data, you still in heterosexual dating markets, you have men that are largely initiating relationships. And so what you end up with, you end up with this really interesting dynamic where you have men that are sending a lot of messages And they start spamming people. They're using, you know, maybe AI these days or they're copying, pasting messages because they're just trying to talk to as many people as possible. And then they're not getting responses. And then you have women that are just overwhelmed with the amount of contact that they're getting and they can't respond to all of it. And so you end up with a dynamic of some people getting really frustrated that they're not getting matches or replies. And then other people that are getting frustrated because they're getting too much attention and they don't want to deal with all of it. And so um, you see some of those dynamics. Also, you see them kind of amplified sometimes on dating apps too, because it takes away some of the rejection. People are more willing to approach people that maybe they wouldn't in person. So in person, you know, you might be interested in someone and you think, okay, no, I'm not going to put myself out there. I'm not going to go up to them on a dating app. Like people will, they'll give it a try. They'll message I'll message anyone. And so um, that also can lead to people being very aspirational in terms of who they're reaching out to and other people getting very overwhelmed by attention. The other issue that we're running into is the apps are being gamed for, as use of promoting other things and other services from promoters looking for uh, girls to take the clubs and to, to, for their work for the the OnlyFans girls to get more eyeballs on the work that they're doing. And those are probably uh, the the biggest offenders, but there's tons of them. Yeah. And so you have people, I mean, the apps try, they try to prevent people from using the platforms for these reasons, but people are still doing it, right? And there's all kinds of motivations that draw people to the apps that are not necessarily involving relationships, whether it's to promote yourself, to promote a product, whether you're on there just because you enjoy getting attention from people. And, you know, sometimes people are in relationships and they're on there because they just like seeing what's out there, but they're not really serious about meeting up with anybody. And then you've got people that are serious. And again, that that kind of contributes to this frustrating dynamic um, for the ones that are serious. Well, I haven't used them since I was uh, living – well, I, since COVID. Um, and now I am 50. But even at 50, I, and I travel a lot, so I always, I will always turn it on and say, just to see what's going on here and to see, do I still got it at 50? Right on. The, my photos still work. <laughs> well, I think there are a lot of people that do this and people, they get in relationships and they also, they forget to delete it or they, you know, they're still getting the notifications because they never deactivate it. And so it also makes it really easy to just kind of like check in every so often. This is part of the loop, right? Yeah. There's a, there's safety there, right? Like if my relationship goes up in flames for whatever reason, I know that I'm, I, I got back. So getting yeah. matches. And, <laughs> and if, if we got one foot in and one foot out the door, then it's, we're not putting our full effort into the relationship that we have. Therefore, that we're disrespecting the other person in that relationship. You know, it's the benefits and the drawbacks of having access to so many partners. It's what dating apps are designed to do. And it's what they do so well is expand the pool and give us more options and make it easier for us to find what we're looking for. And at the same time, we're now seeing all of the repercussions of that as well. And these are problems that maybe we didn't have before that are unique to the experience of using these apps. And is there any data looking at marriage rates and average age of committed relationships with this rise in opportunities, the cheesecake factory effect of staring at an endless menu versus, you know, 
40s, 50s, only really having the people down the street and the people your family were introducing you to. Yeah. I mean, I think we're just starting to see some of the long-term effects of all of this, but I can tell you there's some data from the Pew Research Center that they put out pretty recently that showed that I think about 10% of marriages now start through online dating. And so I guess you can interpret whether you think that's a lot or a little based on how many people are actually using these platforms. So, I mean, there are the success stories. There are people who meet the love of their life through dating apps. I mean, I've done research on this. I've talked to these folks, but at the same time, a decade in, you're also seeing people who have been on the apps from the beginning and they've been swiping, they've been spending money, they've been there this whole time and they haven't been able to find what they're looking for. So we're also reaching that point of burnout for a lot of people and I think really extreme frustration. I certainly have mixed feelings about it. I've, I've used it to great success and really enjoyed it and have met some amazing people that I am still friends with to this day due to that app. And it definitely allowed me to date outside of the pool that I was already in, which was super fun because there was, I had met and was in relationships with people that I would have never had met uh, that were in my circle. And and that was a, was a great thing. But I also, when I started using those apps, uh, I'm Gen X. So Um, I was already in my late 30s uh, when those things came. I was already an adult. I had already had an understanding of the way I perceived relationships and and all of those things. So that is completely different than a a 21 year old who's just moved to New York City and is ready to to put themselves out there into the world. Yeah. I mean, and at that, it's like, I wouldn't, to that person, I would not recommend that. The dating app. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something I think it's curious to people. Um, you know, they look at that and they're like, why would someone that age need a dating app? Like, why do they even bother? Um, and some of it, I mean, it is, they're fun. It's the gamification. And they're also, it, this is the singles bar these days. Like, you know, you used to go out to bars, bar hop, see different people, you know, you know, which bar attracts a certain crowd. Now it's it's the dating apps and people jump around from one to another and this is where the party is these days. But uh, that's also been a really profound shift that's happened because of the apps. And looking at your research and the direction we're headed, what are you excited about? What trends are you investigating? I mean, I'm really excited about the role that AI could play in this experience in terms of making the matchmaking process better. Because right now, I mean, we know it's not perfect. There, If there was an app that could immediately recognize the person who is right for you, there would be no other apps. Like they would corner the market and everyone would just go pay to use that one. So we know that the matchmaking process is imperfect right now. And I think there's a lot of potential with AI to make it better. And I think as that improves, what I'm hoping is that you find a, you end up in a situation where you've got more technology that's actually bringing people back to our roots, how we've always met in person, getting them off of the apps and actually meeting face to face. Um, I've also been doing some work looking at virtual reality and how that could play a role in this landscape going forward. Um, what it's like to meet someone in a virtual environment and have a conversation as an avatar. (laughs) And so I think that's a a ways away, but exploring these different um, possibilities for how people might interact with each other that don't involve just endlessly swiping through profiles. And talking about the, the, the AI learning to give you better matches. I mean, I'm sure all of us have purchased certain things from Instagram and Facebook because the AI ads completely nailed exactly what we were looking for. And maybe we hadn't even verbalized it to ourselves yet, but it nailed it. And then we get stuff that we're like, are you, what are you telling me, Facebook? What are you telling me, Instagram? Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Do you know something that I don't? Yeah. Because now I'm worried. (laughs) So, you know. So, if Johnny yeah. and I were VCs to invest in your dating AI, what would you like to see as markers for success towards relationship building through digital intervention? 
Oh, gosh, this is an excellent question. I mean, some of it, I think the matchmaking is only going to be as good as the data that you're providing to the platform. And so right now that data is largely coming in the form of profiles. Like that's how we're making our decisions. You know, we're reading somebody's profile and we're deciding whether we want to swipe on them, swipe left or swipe right. Um, I think that this is not necessarily how we evaluate people in person. When we're having conversations, we pay attention to different qualities. So I think using AI to get at some of those more conversational dynamics, you know, getting at the way we actually interact with somebody, I think there's a lot of promise there versus reading a profile and making a decision based on information that's often very superficial and kind of meaningless when it comes to building a relationship with somebody. So if AI can be used to get at how we actually interact, um, that would be something that would be very exciting for me. We'll see if we get there. Yeah, I, I know for me in, in my dating history, my fear is looking and chasing too much similarity when a lot of the joy that I found in dating is discovering, as Johnny shared, people I wouldn't normally get along with or wouldn't think even sharing completely different interests and passions that I would have chemistry with. Yeah. And right now, I mean, the apps, they learn to recognize patterns and how you're swiping. And so essentially, similarity is going to be a big thing that they're picking up on and also similarity in terms of the types of profiles that you tend to gravitate towards. Well, the girls are picky on who they're swiping, but the guys are swiping on everything and then looking at the match afterwards to see if it's worth pursuing. Yeah, which is a <laughs> terrible <laughs> It's a terrible strategy too, because then you're telling the app I'm not very picky. Just show me any profile because I'll match with anybody. Yeah. Guys are for efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> We're also seeking psychological safety, right? So this idea of trying to avoid rejection, well, it's a lot harder to talk to someone that we don't have similarities, perceived similarities with, when in actuality, it isn't in real life, but we've tried to avoid that potential rejection or the awkwardness of conversation or not knowing what to say next to such a degree that we end up getting matched with people who might be better fit to be a sibling or a friend than an actual romantic partner. Yeah. And it's also about like, what kind of similarity are we talking about? Because in a profile, we're talking about similarities on oftentimes very superficial qualities, like, you know, entertainment, things like that versus similarity in how you interact with somebody like similarity in lifestyle, those sorts of things. It's harder to pick up in a profile. And for those in the audience who might be terrified now of using apps, do you have any guidelines for success or, or helpful strategies that they can implement to, to find success? Yeah, you know, there's so many problems with the apps, but at the same time, I still consider myself an optimist. Like, I think it's important to talk about the problems because I don't think that the technology is going anywhere. So it's about making it work better for people. And there's so many things that this has given us, so many things that you know, the apps do well. And so in terms of how to be successful, like I always tell people, if you're having trouble in the apps, start with your profile, because that really is the basis for everything that's happen happening in the way that they're set up currently. And so changing your profile can have a big impact on changing the types of matches that you're going to get. And also a big impact on whether those matches actually lead to relationships. If, you know, when people meet you, if they feel like you were accurately portraying yourself or if you weren't. Um, and then within the profile, I always tell people, like, make it easy for someone to have a conversation with you. Like some people, I think, are very strategic in how they craft their profiles. And they'll do things like putting in prompts where if somebody wanted to reach out to you, they would already have something to say that's specific to you. So even something like I'm new to the area, I love coffee, always looking for recommendations for best coffee shops. Now, somebody wants to reach out to me, they already know how they can open a conversation, you know, making it easy for people. Like, I think that's always helpful versus them having to figure out, you know, what making it easy for chat GPT. Is, for chat GPT <laughs> to recommend some coffee <laughs> to shops. Give me those three coffee shops to, to send yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think for a lot of our clients and, and fans of the show, they've recognized that the profile, they've become more and more visual. So when we talk about the early aughts of online dating, it was mostly just you clicking away and, and being as verbose and, and vibrant in your writing as possible. And, and now the infusion of short form video and photos, really looking at, you know, what is the image, the visual image that you're projecting into the world? And then 
the other piece that you shared and highlighted is changing up your actual swiping behavior and maybe recognizing that you're spending too much time with a got to catch them all strategy and as wide of a net as possible, uh, or maybe passing the phone to your friend and having your friend have a go to change up the algorithm for you. Yeah. And also, I mean, we know that people experience choice overload on dating apps. They get overwhelmed. Like when you have so many options, it can actually make it more difficult to make a decision. So putting limits on how much you're swiping and only allowing yourself to consider a handful of profiles at a time versus going through so many that the faces are starting to blur together. I mean, that can also be a helpful strategy because we start to deviate from what we're looking for when we get to be really cognitively overwhelmed by all the profiles that we're seeing. I was doing a, a lot of online dating uh, for an episode that we were doing. And this was, I guess this was 2017. And, and I was only dating through Tinder and Bumble and doing a lot of it. And, it, and it, again, I was very much an adult at that time. And it got to a point where I got over it and it, it didn't even want to pick it up for months because I was like, this is ridiculous. However, all of that stimuli and all of that drama from those apps would have been great when I was 25, yeah. <laughs> right? It'd be like, bring, bring, give me more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those limits and, and thinking about how, and, and this is for any, anytime you open your computer on any social media website, you need to be looking at the implications and how it's, it is messing with your mind, which then is directing into your behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Look at you dating yourself, Johnny, talking about opening up a computer when everyone's <laughs> on their, their phones. <laughs> well, thank you so much for stopping by. Where can our audience find out more about the research you do? Yeah, so check out my uh, website, lieselshrabi.com. Check out my blog on psychology today, dating in the digital age. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. 